I'm going to open up my very first podcast with a quote from the movie Moneyball. How can you not be romantic about baseball? Anyone who's played the game or is a fan of the game will feel some sort of way when they think about these words because baseball is romantic. The ethos of the Cork Center podcast is to unravel the many layers to get to the core of America's favorite pastime. So it is fitting this first podcast hones in on the very ball used to play the game. I'm your host, Casey Mack, and this is episode one, Home Zone. Okay, so I think a really good jump off point would be to sort of talk about what it takes to make a baseball and all the materials used in the manufacturing process. It may seem like just a simple ball, but in actuality, it's pretty intricate. In fact, I think it's the only ball used in a sport where it requires actual hand stitching to be put together. In other words, they haven't found a machine that replicates that baseball stitch. A baseball has a cork center with two layers of rubber wrapped around it. This core is then tightly wound with a wool yarn and a cotton thread, which is then covered with a cowhide that is, like I said, hand stitched together. It's kind of interesting to point out that the rules, specifications, and guidelines to making the MLB baseball date all the way back to 1955. As a full-time leather worker, I just sit here and think in awe over the fact that every baseball that's used in a major league game was once at someone's workbench being hand-stitched together. It also makes me question how many baseballs are used in a major league season. A New York Times article from June 21st, 1975 points out that Major League Baseball buys about 250,000 baseballs per year at an average cost of $2 per baseball. That's about a half a mil that Major League Baseball would spend on baseballs, which really doesn't sound like a lot of money, but to give you some perspective, in 1976, Reggie Jackson signed for 3.5 mil with the New York Yankees, which made him the highest paid Major League Baseball player. And to sprinkle in a little bit more perspective, the average cost of a baseball game was $10.97. This same New York Times article from 1975 goes on to state, Major League Baseball confirmed yesterday that it would stop using Spalding baseballs after the 1976 season. Spalding, one of the nation's largest sporting goods manufacturers, has supplied every baseball used by the majors in a century-long relationship. Ouch! A century is a really long time. Think about it, a hundred years they've been using Spalding made baseballs. All of a sudden they just want to stop. What's the holdup? You know, one of the coolest pieces of baseball memorabilia that I have is a Spalding ad that was taken out of a magazine that was printed in 1975. And the title of the ad says, the ball Hank and the babe hit. The ad is patriotically displaying two baseballs on an American flag. For a millennial kid like me, Rawlings is the only thing I've known as far as a supplier of the MLB baseball. And it's crazy to continue to read this ad that says, Spalding has been the official baseball of the National League since it began in 1876. Reach, a registered trademark of Spalding, has been the official baseball of the American League since it was founded in 1901. On April 8, 1974, Hank Aaron passed Babe Ruth as the all-time home run leader. This piece of advertising is trying to showcase the very fact that both players who are basically larger than life hit baseballs that were manufactured by Spalding in the USA. Okay, so let's rewind the tape a little bit. Baseballs are very intricate. Mm -hmm. They're hard to manufacture. Mm -hmm. Major League Baseball regulates pretty tightly on how they're manufactured. Mm -hmm. They have to be (laughs) hand-sewn. And there's this storied history of Spalding manufacturing them for over a hundred years. So again, I'll ask, What's the holdup? The reason was price, said Lee McPhail, the president of the American League. Spalding's 10-year contract would be ending in 1976, over a 5% increase, which would be adding about 10 cents to each baseball. I'd like to think that some people would call that a modest increase, but not Major League Baseball. They scoffed at it. In their 100-year relationships, Balding and Major League Baseball did some really cool collaborations. One that I find the most interesting is when they started producing their own World Series films. 
My original plan for this first episode was to go into the life of Lou Fonseca, and I realized that many of you may not even know who that is, but for the sake of this podcast, I want to focus on his career as the director of promotions for the Major League Baseball. Today's use of the video camera and the replay review take root all the way back in 1933, when Lou Fonseca was the manager of the White Sox. He would use his own home camera and video players at home plate taking cuts. After the film was developed, he would show the footage to the players and highlight the holes in their swings. It's pretty cool because using a camera as an educational tool like he did was kind of new technology. And by 1943, Major League Baseball hired him to direct many promotional films and World Series highlights. One of the films that he directed and narrated is called The Democracy of Baseball. And can you guess who the main sponsor is? Yep, you're right, Spalding. The film was produced in 1951, and it is an interesting film. I'll attach the YouTube link in the show notes below. The premise of the film goes into the history of baseball and how it's intertwined with American democracy. The film is enthusiastically patriotic, and it makes sense because we're only a handful of years after the end of World War II. For someone like me who really loves this post-war era baseball, it does touch my heart. The key tenet of this 1951 film is that wherever old glory flies near a home run fence, there's no end to democracy. Baseball is the voice of America. There's this rare combination of competition and cooperation. When game time rolls around, there are no social barriers. It's everyone's game. Feeling victorious over Germany and Japan following World War II, most Americans viewed this post-war world full of optimism. The war laid an economic foundation that allowed mass upward mobility. With this growing economic prosperity comes more leisure time, and baseball was at the centermost part of this. It was the national pastime. And here I'm going to repeat, how can you not be romantic about baseball? And I'm not trying to say the U.S. is perfect, and by no means is there no fault in the U.S. society. There were racial and social injustices for people of color. Yes, we still had Jim Crow laws down in the South, but there was progress. We all know and love the story of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier in 1947. His lead also opened doors to players like Larry Dobby and Hank Thompson and so many more. We also see at this time a major sweeping influx of Latino players. Minnie Minoso came from Cuba and initially played in the Negro Leagues for the New York Cubans. After a few seasons there, he became the first black Latino player in Major League Baseball. His lead opened doors for other Latino players like Chico Carrasquel, Roberto Clemente, Tony Olivia, Orlando Cepeda, and so many more. Have you ever wondered why Latin American countries like Cuba and the Dominican Republic produce so many major leaguers? It may be an oversimplification, but it's mainly because the U.S. sent troops to both countries. As the 19th century was waning, right when baseball is spreading like wildfire throughout the U.S., abroad, the U.S. Navy was trying to spread democracy onto Caribbean islands who had been Spanish colonies for hundreds of years. The U.S. entered a short but successful conflict called the Spanish-American War. Although it was only a few months long, the long-term impact was huge. Gaining Cuban independence was at the core of this war, but also the U.S. wanted to use its powerful influence to impart democracy. Baseball was used as a tool to cultivate and nurture Cuba into adopting democratic values. And did it work? Most of you know the answer. In similar fashion, the U.S. used military influence to occupy the DR in the midst of World War I. President Woodrow Wilson declared the U.S. would remain neutral during the Great War, but increasing German submarine warfare in the Atlantic caused a lot of concerns about the possibility of the Central Power setting up a strategic base of attack in the Dominican Republic. So while still remaining neutral, the U.S. government began a military occupation of the country in 1916. The U.S. joined the Allies in World War I, April 6, 1917, and would continue using the DR as a military base until 1924, which is roughly about six years after the war ended. So, like the Cuban occupation a decade earlier, the U.S. used baseball as a mechanism for occupation. Haiti, which is in the neighborhood of these countries, shares the island of Hispaniola with the Dominican Republic and also neighbors Cuba to the southwest. The national language is a Haitian Creole, which is a product of the transatlantic slave trade and a mixture of French and many African languages. Their history is a sad one. Instability seems to have a rather large occurrence. Like Cuba and the DR, the U.S. occupied Haiti from 1915 to 1934. 
Much of this is because from 1911 to 1915, seven presidents were either assassinated or overthrown. During this tumultuous time, German presence in the Caribbean was at its height. With World War I churning, German inculcation into Haitian society really threatened the Wilson administration. Haiti, which is about the size of Maryland, also had a major investment in the sport of baseball, but nothing like Cuba or the DR. The Haitian people, sadly, are a people of labor. Despite the United States' best efforts in the early 1900s, the sport never really took off. But if we fast forward to the 70s and 80s, about 95% of America's baseballs were manufactured in the capital city of Port-au-Prince. To quote Frank Litsky from a New York Times article from September 12, 1971, quote, So almost all of the people who make most of the world's supply of baseballs have no idea how the game is played, end quote. The player pipeline of the Spanish-speaking Caribbean countries in juxtaposition to the Haitian baseball manufacturing mecca is, in and itself, the most fascinating occurrence. Rawlings opened its first plant in Haiti in 1969, and at its height in the late 80s, Rawlings had one of the largest baseball factories with about a thousand employees all hand-stitching baseballs. The ultimate question is what attracted baseball manufacturers to Haiti? In order to even come close to answering that question, we need to first set the stage for what's happening in Haiti in the late 1960s. The country was under rule by Papa Doc Duvalier, who was elected president in 1957. Though he fashioned himself as a bulwark against communism, he did rule with a repressive bent towards totalitarianism. He was a complicated figure who seemed to have beef with every surrounding country, including the U.S., he used his armed guard and military to engage in tactics of intimidation and repression to anyone who opposed his reign. He even developed a weird cultic following due to identifying as a voodoo priest. He used propaganda to elevate his image to a godhead with Jesus Christ and proclaimed he was the physical embodiment of the island nation. Papa Doc's government created the most violent and poverty-stricken countries in the Western Hemisphere. The mixture of his dogmatic ruling and voodoo mysticism produced some of the world's greatest unemployment rates at about 50%. Sure, his government offered cheap land and low tax incentives that lured investors, but the simple fact that Haiti had one of the world's lowest minimum wages attracted baseball manufacturers to the island. Because of the spherical shape of a baseball and the precise number of 108 stitches, stitching the leather cover on a baseball has to be done by hand. Like I said previously, there isn't a machine that can do this precise stitching. And if I'm gonna take a stab in the dark, I'm guessing it would take me about 30 minutes to sew a baseball. Come to find out, 30 minutes isn't even close for what the minimum requirements were at these Haitian baseball sewing factories. These such factories only employed young women to do the job. Each worker was expected to sew four baseballs per hour, so an eight-hour shift would produce 32 baseballs. The Frank Litsky article I previously talked about highlighted a woman named Virginia Pierre, who on a good day would sew 104 baseballs. Seeing as Virginia was so efficient, she topped the scales at $3 a day. Most of the other women were paid $1.50 a day. The U.S. Embassy in Haiti reported in 1971 that just over 7 million baseballs were manufactured in Haiti, worth about $3.2 million. That roughly equals about $2.15 a baseball. And so the hardest information I tried to find was what was the MSRP of a baseball in the 1970s. The closest answer was about $15 in the late 80s. During the 80s, at the height of baseball manufacturing in Haiti, the minimum wage jumped from $1.30 a day to around $3 a day. If that $15 MSRP per baseball is true, and we compare it to the wages that these women were making, then that profit is pretty staggering, and it gives you a, kind of an icky feeling. Today, the Rawlings official MLB ball retails for $25 on their website. All of these baseballs are manufactured in Costa Rica. And despite Rawlings and Major League Baseball investing so much into manufacturing in Haiti, that by 1990, all the Haitian baseball manufacturing plants had completely dried up and mostly moved to Costa Rica or China. And so why the move? Why invest in manufacturing in a country only to leave it about 20 years later? 
The combination of a fragile economy and an unstable government forced these major baseball corporations to leave the country in the late 80s. A military coup eventually overthrew the government, and so when Papa Doc died, his son, Jean-Claude, took over with absolute power, and like his father, he led a life of corruption, theft, and constant games of reallocating funds to him personally during his 15-year presidency. The ultimate question is, how did we get here? Why were poverty-stricken women on a Caribbean island making baseballs for basically slave wages? The 1970s are considered the inflationary decade, and it's not hard to see the correlation between overseas manufacturing and the rise of unemployment during this period. Sure, other factors contributed to inflation like a massive NASA budget, an expensive war in Vietnam, gas price hike as a result of an oil embargo fueled by unrest in the Middle East, but seeking cheap manufacturing labor across the globe aided to double-digit inflation and slow growth in the U.S. I've debated how I'd like to conclude these podcasts, and ultimately, I think doing an off-the-cuff rant reflecting on all the facts would be an interesting take. So, here we go. In creating this podcast, I really wanted to set up two narratives. I opened up the podcast by talking about how baseball's romantic, and I really truly believe that. But if we compare the other narrative of baseball manufacturing moving down to Haiti in the 70s, it creates a whole different feeling. And if I'm going to let my bias show through, I personally think that baseball is the American pastime, so baseball should be made here in the U.S. Am I right? I mean, the game's mostly played here on American soil, so why not have it made here? Spalding manufactured baseballs for the MLB for over 100 years. And so we have this, like I said, storied history of us manufacturing the very ball used to play the American pastime. And if I try to remove my bias, I understand why these companies moved elsewhere. American labor became too expensive, so they had to seek labor in other countries. I get that. But what I can't understand or what I can't wrap my head around is why we moved baseball manufacturing down to Haiti invested in the people down there, provided jobs to people down there, and then totally uprooted only 20 years later. I think the more romantic story is if Rawlings stayed down in Haiti and continued to provide jobs and economic support to the people of Haiti. The 80s and 90s in Haiti were tumultuous, mostly due to military coups and government overthrow, and I understand why Rawlings left. But what if they continued to stay there, through it all, through all the coups, and provided economic stability in a country in need? That's a storyline I could buy into, but that's not what happened. Rawlings moved to Costa Rica and China and other places around the world only to seek cheap labor. So my parting question is this. Did the baseball manufacturing corporations inappropriately use the fine people of Haiti? All right, if you've made it this far, thank you for sticking around and make sure to like and subscribe on either Spotify or YouTube. If you want to check out my leather work, please head to macprovisions.com or check me out on social media. My handle is at macprovisions.